All right, Kurt. Kurt, oh, where are you from originally? Where'd you grow up? Born in Hollywood, California. You're an LA boy. LA boy. You, uh, you had mom and dad growing up? I did for the first um, few years of my life. They divorced when I was probably around five years old and that kind of kicked off my ultimate awareness of what we're here to talk about today. You, uh, how, how would you describe what, what your family dynamic was? Um, it was pretty bad. It was, it was, you know, it was, um, pretty violent. My, my, my dad was um, a big guy and, and was pretty violent towards my mother, um, loud. And, you know, so I, I kind of grew up in a, in a pretty tense environment. Um, you know, we were middle-class people. My dad was an executive with, with Bullock's, so. uh, clothing line and store chain and um, my mother was a nurse and um, so it was it was you know I, I don't have a lot of memory of my uh, my parents together um, actually my my one of my first memories was was finding my mother trying to commit suicide hanging herself in the garage and I was four or five years old and I um, put the chair back under her feet and so you think your mom knew what, what was going on? Oh yeah, she knew what was going on, and and she and the, the way that I became aware of it after she they separated was she was always talking a lot about it. You know, she she was. So so, so tell us what uh, what was what your dad was into. Uh, my dad was considered you know one of California's most prolific and dangerous um, sexually violent predators was his classification. Um, when he, if you looked at his profile in a sex registry he was he had that he had that affixed to his his um his profile so he was he was um had been in, in to prison a number of times and of of the i believe five times he went to prison three of those times were as a result of my um going to law enforcement about information that i had things that he was you were in, turning him in involved in. yeah ultimately I, I did turn him in which, but, which what, what age did that start um, that that didn't start until I was in my early 20s. Um, the first time I was in my early 20s. Prior to that, when it, prior to prior to I left home at 16, and and prior to that, I, you know, I, I started to have some clashes with my father on a physical level, and you know, he was a big guy, so I got I got the short end of it pretty much because I was still a kid, and so I, I moved out at at 16, and then you're you're a big guy. I'm a big guy. He was a big guy. He was even bigger than me. He was. Um, he had played football for the Navy, and he had. He was a big guy. So he was. And, and his, his victims were young. Young females, um, not in the family. Um, I have a sister. I actually have three sisters. All of them are half sisters. Um, to my knowledge, to my knowledge, he he did not actually molest any of my sisters. Um, he he seemed to have his attraction out, outside the family. I, I think... Other kids in the neighborhood? Kids in the neighborhood, friend, ki uh, children of friends, things like that. So, um, it, 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 you know, what I, what I recall is that there was always, you know, this, this upheaval of movement, like we needed to move suddenly from somewhere, and it was, and that's when I was small, I didn't really understand. Um, and, you know, as it turned out, those were always at a point where something had happened, he had victimized somebody in the area, either law enforcement or family of that person was onto it and he was concerned so we would we would leave but there was yeah you know the, the dynamic of family was pretty bad um you know my mother once they separated became quite revengeful towards my father so really never had anything anything good to say about him and was very forthcoming about his his activity as a as a pedophile which i, I didn't really at that point didn't really understand completely what it meant. I mean, I heard the stories, but I didn't, didn't really understand it. Um, and then my, my mother started doing things like she had us placed in juvenile hall when I was just seven years old. Um, so um, I, even with my mother, I, I, I didn't have a very stable, communicative type relationship. It was just kind of always a drama-based situation. And she would, you know, again, it was, it, Whenever, whenever the issue of my father came up, it was, you know, uh, describing these monstrous type of activities that he was into. And 
again, at that point, I didn't really totally. She, she knew about it. Did oh, she, she knew about it. She knew about it. She never took any action against it. Um, I guess he was, you know, also like on the kinky side with her was having her go out and sleep with other men and come tell him about it and this kind of stuff like that. So he was, I guess he was, you know, he had a lot of sexual yeah. drives in different directions, but you know, it was those, those, those issues between adults were never <laughs> something that I worried about. It was when I finally, you know, became to understand really what he was about. I was probably 13 years old. Um, and there was a, a local girl in the neighborhood. Her brother was a friend of mine. And um, one day she brought me this really, really graphic porno magazine. And that was before the internet when we, we had magazines. <laughs> so she brings me this really, you know, triple X porn magazine. And on the magazine, there was all of this handwriting. And my father was left-handed and had just had this dramatic slant with his, his handwriting. So I took one look at the handwriting and I, I knew that it was my father had written that. And it was di directed to her. The words were, Joy, I'm going to do this to you and this to you. And so it was at, at that moment, I, I have a very vivid recollection of at that moment, I, I decided that there just wouldn't be, um, there wouldn't be a way for my father to um, be able to any longer like influence me on a morality or integrity kind of level. I, I just knew that that was over. Mm. Um, so I, I kind of started coming to those types of conclusions at a pretty early age. Um, and, and then left home at 16 because the violent clashes between my dad and I were, were getting out of hand. Somebody was going to, and it would have been me probably, um, excuse me, um, somebody would have gotten hurt. So, um, yeah, left home. We were living in Palm Springs at the time in California. I moved down to Huntington Beach. My older brother was living down there and, you know, engaged in my early adult years. But, you know, obviously I never forgot about these issues with my father. Um, it was at that time something that I, I wasn't dwelling on. But later on, as I, I, my, my, I have a half brother and sister that are younger than me. And they both started telling me of things that were going on around the house, things that he was doing. He had, I guess, molested a couple of my sister's friends. Do you, do you have any idea of how many victims your dad had? Not in an accurate number, but just knowing how prolific he was and how many uh, instances that did come to my attention. I, I have little doubt that there were hundreds of victims that he ultimately came in contact with in his lifetime. Um, there was one instance in when I was about eight, nine years old, we were living in Oceanside, California, and um, we were sitting on, on the balcony outside of our apartment, and there was this young girl who was probably maybe a year and a half old. She was just still a toddler. And he was, she was standing there next to him, and he was just, I just remember that he had his hand up her little dress, and I, I remember seeing it and connecting with it and registering it, not really fully understanding what it meant at that point. But yeah, I guess I knew something was happening there at that moment that wasn't right, wasn't right. And that needed to be addressed. Yeah, I, I could see it. Yeah. Wow. So that's, that's, um, yeah, I, I'm not sure if that's the, the first time. I think it probably is maybe the first time that I actually physically saw this, this going on. Um, but it could have happened, but that, that's just probably the most vivid hmm. recollection of that, that I have. So it was common knowledge in the family. It was common knowledge. Yeah, everybody. And, and so my, my uncle, who he wasn't a, an A-lister, but he was a, you know, he was a, he was a pretty, fairly prominent actor in Hollywood. He, he was in a lot of well-known movies and TV shows and things like that. And he didn't use that very recognizable Dutch last name. He used a, an abbreviation of it. And um, my uncle told me, um, I was probably in my 40s when he, he told me this, but my uncle told me that, in fact, uh, my grandmother had molested my father when he was a baby and that that's how he became introduced to it, that this is, in fact, had been some sort of generational thing that had gone on in the family for many years, uncles. Yeah. So um, that was... 
you know, my, my grandmother was a, was a very difficult person and she, she was, you know, she and I had a lot of clashes. Um, but it was difficult for me to hear because at, when he told me that she had already passed away and I was like, well, you know, why now? Why are, why are you telling me this now? I mean, if this is something that you know, why isn't this a family issue that's being dealt with? And, you know, uh, as we talked about, um, back in the, back in, the, in the past, it, this seemed to be an issue that people tended to sweep under the rug as a way of, of dealing with it to protect the, the good name of the family, um, embarrassment, um, just, just shame, whatever. For me, you know, I, I, I was never a victim of sexual abuse as a child, but I was a victim of other types of abuse as a child and just, you know, being manipulated and twisted between my, my two parents and their vengefulness towards each other. I, I, I the, the good name and, and that never meant anything to me. I just felt that I needed to step up and, and bring this out in the open for one reason and one reason only, and that was to potentially protect even one child. If it was just one, then great. Um, and so, um, yeah, I, I ultimately made that decision to go to the authorities and let them know about what my my younger brother and sister were telling me, um, and that resulted in his, his first conviction at, at my report, my turning him in. And... Um, he did, I think, three years, and then and then came out. Um, he did three years. He just did three years. Yeah, he's he, he's he's. My dad was a really charismatic guy. He, people really loved my yeah, dad. Yeah, often are. Yeah, he he he. You know, they called him Coach Kim. Like, you know, he was the coach. Like, he he could just go and hang out with the football coaches, and yeah, he just had that. And then he would, you know, do the God thing, or he'd be a pastor, or whatever. He just could kind of jump from skin to skin pretty 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 easily um so um that that dynamic i think leads to a lot of people just kind of refusing to believe it oh i can't believe that you know you're just a teenager that doesn't get along with your your dad you know that's that's normal right so it, it there was a lot of things that i think led to him being able to keep this under the radar of the fact that it was a, a well-known family dynamic, but yet not one person in the family chose to stand up to it. In fact, my uncle, who, you know, was the father of one, you know, my, my cousin Carrie is a very beautiful woman, and she was a really pretty kid. And, and I can recall my uncle telling me that, oh, you know, your father is just a, he's just a flasher. You know, he, he, he doesn't really do anything to hurt them. He just, you know, shows himself or whatever. And he said, if you, if your dad did that to, to my daughter, Carrie, I wouldn't even care. And I can just remember just wanting to fly across the room and tear into my uncle pretty badly because I was just like... Argh. So, yeah, that was, that was pretty amazing. So that just kind of tells you where, you know, once, once people get the perspective of it's just keep it quiet. It's no big deal. It's really easy for this type of victimization to go on for years and years and years and years until until somebody finally stands up to it. So, uh, on the last the last instance with my father, he ended up getting a ten year sentence, of which he did seven in prison. And um, I was telling you that I had become acquainted with um, Maureen Kanka, who was the mother of Megan Kanka, which is the person namesake of Megan's law. And so because I was a witness with, with the district attorney's office in Riverside County where he, had, where he had been sentenced, the district attorney contacted me and said, hey, your dad's going to be getting out in a few weeks, and I just want to let you know. And, and, and so I was just like, oh, I was upset and kind of panicked. So I, I, I called Maureen and I said, hey, this is my dad's getting out. I don't know if there's anything we can do about this. And um, she said, well, I'm... I'm personal friends with Dan Lundgren, the attorney general in California. Let me see what I can do. And a um, few days later, I get a call from the district attorney again in Riverside, and they're like, change of plans. He's now been remanded to on an indefinite hold to an Atascadero State Hospital, which is a part of the prison system. It's basically a hospital for the criminally insane. Um, 
And so he did, he did, he finished out his 10 year sentence there, that he did finish the final three years there, and then was given the option of being released, but only if he paid for his own castration process. Now, I don't know if this is a chemical castration, if it's a physical removal of his, his, you know, his bag, I don't, I don't know. You know, I just know that he, that according to what he had told me, that it was a $30,000 procedure that he ended up having to pay for, and that was the only way that he got out. Um, ironically, a few years later, there was a radio show, and I can't remember which one it was, but um, they were talking to a guy who claimed to be the first person ever castrated by the state of California um, and released. And I was like, that's really interesting because this happened to my father at least three years before this. So I believe that there was probably a process of this going on more on a secretive type level. The state wasn't talking about it and that they had decided that there must be some. Do, do, do you feel like that cured him in any way? Um, no, no, I didn't. I don't believe that it cured him in any way. Um, in fact, the first girl that I turned him in for when I was in my early 20s was a young lady named Marissa and she was only 11 years old at the time and her mother was a methamphetamine addict. And my father had some apartments and so was giving her mother free rent and the mother was giving my father access to Marissa at 11 years old and was taking her camping and yeah, so that's that's was the first time that I turned him in and so ironically um, after he got out of prison, I, I told you that I, of the three times that he went to prison, I, I met him at the prison gates and um, was there to give him a ride back to Los Angeles. From, once from San Luis Obispo and the other one was somewhere in the central part of the state. Um, and so, um, At one point after he was released for the last time, he must have been 70, 74 years old, 75 years old, something like that. And I was out at his home in Palm Springs and the phone rings and he keeps picking up the phone and then hanging it up. He's not answering it. He's not answering it. And after like the 10th time, he says to me, do you know who that is who's calling me? And I'm like, oh, how would I know who's calling you? He says, well, it, it's Marissa. But I'm thinking, Marissa, like I knew who Marissa was on that, his victim, but it's Marissa, this girl that you, you know, I, you turned me in for 12 years ago. So now Marissa's an adult. She's 23, 24 years old. She actually has a family. She's married and I think had a couple, two or three kids in, in Tennessee, I think. But still believed that she was in love with my father. Yeah. She's calling him and saying that he was, he never, she never considered herself a victim. He, he, he called and, and, I said, next time she calls, answer the phone and let me talk to her. Because I never talked to her. I just knew about what was going on, and, but I had never met her. You know? So I said, look, I'm, I'm Kurt. I'm the one that you know, turned my dad in for what was going on between you guys when you were a child. And, um, and she just was animate. He never victimized me. What he did to me, I was okay with. He was the best father figure I ever had. I love your dad. I just said, just, you know, I, I just... Kind of, you know, didn't plead with her, but I just said, "Look, you know, you're you're a mom now. You've got your own babies. Just just turn away from, walk away from this experience because there is nothing good here for you and and or for the people that you're bringing into this world as as a mom." How old was your dad at this point? Seventy four, seventy five, and I can remember him after I, I got off the phone, and I was, I was in tears. I, I sometimes when I get mad, I start to get teary eyed. <laughs> so I was kind of in tears, like steaming up my, my ears probably. And I remember he looked at me and he goes, well, I, I think it's pretty cool that a 24, 25 year old girl is in love with a 75 year old man. And I, that was kind of like my uncle saying what he said about his daughter, you know, I just about freaking lost it. So, um, as I, as I told you, I'm, I'm, I, I, I ended up going camping with my dad after that. I took him camping because I wanted to have a a one on one, very solitary opportunity to to say what I had to say to my dad about this activity and what I felt about his impact on so many innocent lives. 
my own not for I really never you know my dad was not the greatest dad to me he didn't treat me but I, I always don't I don't consider myself to be my dad's greatest victim by any stretch of the imagination right you you weren't a victim of him no I was not a victim of his pedophilia and I and I was a victim of his you know physical abuse as a father he was, he was looking for young girls yeah, he was he was into young girls, and again, he there was some consciousness there about the family dynamic. If it's true about what my uncle said about my grandmother, um, he didn't seem to want to keep it in the family. However, as I told you, I did have um, a younger half brother and sister, and as it turned out, my younger brother decided to follow in my father's footsteps and also became a pedophile. Um, was was went in went in as a as a medic uh, into the into the, into the Navy and just, you know, finished really high. I went in as an officer and was about to have a start a really nice military career. And he finished his training and everything. And he had like three weeks break before he had to report to duty. And he, um, I told him, man, go to Europe, go, go do something fun, you know, go do something real. And he ended up going back to the bowling alley in Palm Springs and hanging out and hooking up with a 13 year old and ended up raping her at knife points. And, um, yeah, so he ended up getting arrested for that, removed from the military. He did three years there. Um, and then he um, he got out and promised to walk the straight line, would never do that again, And but ended up getting back into it. And he he's actually, um, there's a fair, his case is fairly well known on the internet, actually, because he tried to, he contacted a prostitute and she came and then while they were together she told him that she had a 10 year old daughter and he tried arranging <laughs> for this woman to bring a daughter for a some kind of disgusting threesome so her pimp was so put off by that that he decided to go to the police and they set my brother up and, and ended up giving him 10 years in prison and they made him do the full 10 years in, in, in Arizona um, just just for trying to think about doing it which was fine and he got out a couple of years ago and I tried talking to him and but but I was at his court martial um, in in from the military and told the judge look if he like with my father I, I won't be quiet about this if he gets out and I get any word of his involvement in this type of activity I'm I'm going right straight to the authorities and he should know that loud and clear um, so yeah um, I, I was never I was never involved in my brother going to prison. He managed to find his way there on his own. Um, but this is a generational situation in my family. You think it's something learned, or do you think it's a, it's a in the in the DNA? I think it's a learned thing. Yeah. I, I think I think so much of this this type of dysfunction is something that that doesn't. It doesn't appear without some sort of influence, some sort of impotence of yeah, for your uncle, your dad, your yeah. You know, my my uncle said that that it was my grandmother was focused on my father, but my uncle was older, um, and and it's difficult for me to believe if she was doing the kind of things that he said she was doing to my father that she wasn't doing the same thing to him, but that supposedly she had been victimized by um, an uncle and 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 on and on and on and on, so. I, you know, all of those kinds of stories just made it that much more um, absolute that I had to, you know, take some kind of action that there had to be one person in this whole picture that that tried to stop this because I, I have a total of eight brothers and sisters, only two full brothers, but the other six are half brothers and sisters and they all know about the situation and none of them. My, my older brother. Did they all know about it? They all know about it, yeah. My older brother is, a, is an attorney in Carlsbad in California, and my younger brother still lives in the same area in Palm Springs that we grew up in and where all of this happened. Um, he just basically, they all just basically ignored my father. They just disconnected from him. They didn't have anything to do with him, but they certainly didn't take any kind of action, any kind of preventative measure to... Your dad is no longer alive. He's no longer alive. Yeah, he passed away in um, in 2017. Um, the story was is that he had fallen out of bed and broken a hip and laid there for a couple of days and then had suffered so much kind of damage from laying there. Intuitively, and and I've often been correct about these kind of <laughs> feelings, is that um, he probably victimized somebody and and somebody. You know, 
probably gave him a beat down and that he that was you know falling out of bed was probably the story i can't say for sure because i don't have those facts but um who went to the funeral what's that who went to the funeral uh nobody nobody no he was cremated by a friend um and, and, and because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't trying to like lob darts at my dad. Like I wasn't trying to take action, but from the, from the, from a distance, you know what I mean? Like I said, I went to pick him up at the prison gate when he got out to tell him that I was feel good about what I did and I'll do it again if you go there again. And I want you to know that. I want you to know that I don't hate you as a human being, but I'm not, I'm not, I'm not standing. You're just trying to protect some kids. Yeah, I'm just trying to. And so I, I know that in the, I guess, 13 14 years he did in prison. I'm, I'm, I'm sure that there was some number of kids that avoided his mm -hmm. his uh, his behavior and, and his victimization. Uh, my 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 brother, who himself who did 10 years in Arizona, um, he had stayed in contact with my dad. They they had enough common ground, I guess, that they they stayed in contact. And when, so when he when he died and he was cremated, um, my brother got out of prison. He then went to California up near Mammoth where my father had died and um, the friend had his ashes. And so my brother um, sent me some of my father's ashes, which to me was powerful. It was, it was, it was a good thing. You know, it, was, it, was, it was a full circle kind of feeling um, that, you know, like I said, that I never was hiding from him as a person. I, 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 you know, I was his son and dealt with him on that level and in, in truth because truth is to me something that just can't be it can't be altered it can't be manipulated it's just the truth and you either embrace it or you don't and so I I know that I I, I know that I took the, the correct action and you know the reason why I wanted to, to talk to you today Mark is because I I'm hoping that my story you know will reach even one person, you know, that might find themselves in a similar situation that's, a, you know, that knows that somebody that they know is, is, is victimizing other people and that, you know, there's a million reasons that might come to mind about why you shouldn't take action. But at the end of the day, you know, we are all a human family, right? And, and so little children especially deserve to be protected. And if you're aware that somebody is victimizing in particular children, but anybody. It's very commendable that you you have the courage to speak up. Well, thank you, thank you. It's, um, you know, it, it, it uh, as I told you, I don't, I no longer carry that very distinguishable Dutch last name with the capital S in the middle of it. I, I did change my name after seeing, um, one day watching the news, they were doing an expose on the top 20 child predators in California and good old dad was number nine. And I just said, <laughs> Five hundred dollars to change my name. Okay, I'm doing that. So I changed my name in two thousand two thousand four. I changed my name about twenty years ago. And, and what does your life look like now? You you, you moved to New York. I moved to New York. Um, I, I you know I've 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 lived all over the world. I was I lived in Argentina for a good period of between two thousand and four and two thousand and eleven. Um, came back to California. Um, out here in New York, taking advantage of a business opportunity. I've, I've always been kind of, um, kind of a rolling stone. I, I think, you know, um, my father, there, some of the other influences that my father had on me was that he was kind of a, for, for a period of my childhood, we lived on the road. Um, we, we lived about four years where I didn't go to school and we traveled around the country in a, in a Chevy van, which I think was actually a period where he tried to just keep himself away from people that he could victimize. And I think that that's kind of what I, I, I recognize from that from that period of time. And it was an interesting period of time, so, but it, it also put in me a, you know, a willingness to, to just f go wherever my dreams led me and my goals led me. You know, I wasn't about growing up and staying in the same town. And like I was telling you, my younger brother, on the other hand, is married to his first girlfriend. They had five kids. They still live in Palm Springs, where we went to high school, and it's just a completely different dynamic. So yeah, yeah, my life my life is good. You know, I know that. These kinds of these kinds of family dynamics they they take their toll you know they they definitely do like I had a I had a, a quadruple bypass at a pretty early age ironically it was two days prior to my dad having one he had one two days later but I was only thirty eight years old when that happened to me and I think um, you know yeah when you grow up in that kind of a household where there's a lot of tension and a lot of fear and a lot of anxiety all the time it's it's you it's you can you can 
develop some kind of habit patterns and how you deal with and react to life that ultimately end up not necessarily being so good for your health. So yeah, I've come a long way, man. I've, I've, you know, I, I, I just, yeah, I just prefer to try to keep things real and keep things truthful. And, um, I'm glad I would, I would again, encourage anybody that might find themselves in any kind of a similar position to really, um, believe in, believe in your, in yourself. And if you're being led to, to do the right thing, please do the right thing. Help, help another, another human being, help a child. Um, at the end of the day, um, it, it, you'll, 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 I'm sure be like me and know in your heart that it was the right thing to do. And I, I would, I would do it again as many times as, as I had the opportunity to do so. So, yeah, that's great. That's Thank you so story. much for sharing your story. Sure. No problem. Thank you for letting the truth prevail. Thank you. The world yeah. needs a, lot, a little more of that. Yeah. Yeah. The world does need a little bit more of that. I think, you know, right now we're going through a period of time where, you know, uh, where, where the world is very digital and it's quite easy to, before it got swept under the rug, now we can just, you know, change it around and make it look different. But the truth, as I said, the truth is the truth. And it's not something that can be altered or manipulated. We all know what the truth is. And I think ultimately we all know right from wrong. And when we are presented with that, that, that challenge in life, we pretty much all know the right thing to do. The right thing to do. And now, now let's just follow through and do it. That's great. <laughs> all right, Kurt. Thank you very much. No, thank you.